Hey everyone, this is Dr. Scott Haggerty here with Elite Family Chiropractic. And hey guys, super excited to be able to, um, to jump in and talk about fertility versus infertility today. So as we go through, I am gonna jump in and we are gonna go into presentation mode here so we can start diving into this information. So moms and dads, I wanna share with you a couple of really important things. As we jump into this, if you are someone that is struggling with fertility issues, a couple of things that I wanna dive into right away. Today's point is to be able to talk about why so many people are struggling with infertility, talk about some common causes, talk about common reasons why we're seeing this increase so much, talk about things that you can do to become empowered to improve your fertility naturally. One problem that, that we tend to see a lot is that many times people enter into this, um, this predicament where they're being told they're infertile and they're not really given ways that they can improve fertility in a way that's natural. And I know, you know, when we get people who come in here and we've had a lot of people over the years that have struggled with infertility when they come in, they're never really given anything other than one or two ways. One is hormone therapy, one is IVF. And those obviously are difficult choices because there are side effects. And when we go through and we talk about infertility, we know that these are difficult choices. And oftentimes, if we are not really given the ways that we can potentially help to improve fertility naturally, most of us would choose to go down the road of trying to find better, more natural ways to help our body become fertile. So let's talk a little bit about stats as we dig in here, because if you're here, you're probably are someone who is dealing with infertility, um, have someone that you love that is dealing with infertility, or looking for ways to help someone that you love. So let's start talking numbers. Number one, one in five couples are dealing with infertility worldwide. This is a huge number. The most common reasons for this are things such as endometriosis, about 10 to 20% of couples, that's the main cause. There are adhesions that are in the abdomen that can be a big contributing factor. There can be things like tubal diseases in the fallopian tubes. There can be abnormal cervical mucus. Um, and the other 10-ish percent of that number, what they call unidentified factors. There is, there's a lot in there um, from what they know, because when you talk about that, those percentages, these are only documented causes. There are a lot that they call idiopathic. They don't know why people are developing infertility. So of the things they can prove, those are the things that we went through. When we start looking at this, it's important that we start looking around the reasons why we see things in physiology where they may not be working the way that they should, and it's preventing, pre pre preventing fertility. So let's talk first about IVF. I want to dig into this for a minute here because we're going to jump back and forth into IVF, how it works, um, and reasons for and against IVF, but also we're gonna really dig heavy into things that you can do before going down this pathway. So for those of you who are considering IVF, you know, it is something that is, is very well known. Um, some cons to IVF, and I'll start with that right now, is it's, it's very expensive. Um, you know, very rarely is there their coverage, and if it is, it's pretty minimal. So most people have to out of pocket when doing IVF. The success rate's not very high. Um, in women between 40 and 45, unfortunately, there is an 80% miscarriage rate when they do IVF. In women over 40, only 15% become pregnant through IVF. So, so again, very low numbers. <clears throat> For many couples, unfortunately, it is their only chance of conceiving when they are considered to be high risk. Um, and you know there are definite risks when you do this, um, but many people will choose it regardless of the success rates. Infer infertility has become a major, major, major health, a worldwide health epidemic. Um, we are looking that we were looking at this in terms of, you know, this the significant increase in infertility. Um, but what oftentimes is not being told is that when you choose healthcare procedures like IVF, there are risks for this. And I say this not to dissuade you. I say that because oftentimes informed consent is not given fully in situations like this. So let me go through a list of some of the things that we have from documented stats on, on IVF risks. Number one, cervical mucus changes. And so if you've never heard this before, one of the reasons why this is important is because cervical mucus changes can affect sperm motility, making it more difficult for the little swimmers to make it where they're supposed to. There can be things like ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, blood clots, unfortunately, are our common side effect, kidney damage fluid buildup in the chest and abdomen, depression, because obviously we are working with hormonal changes, ectopic pregnancies, multiple births are extremely, extremely common. And of course, because people who are going down the road of IVF, IVF they are also at greater risk of birth interventions and other complications. 
Now, for those of you that are familiar with our practice, you may have heard this from us already. If you're not familiar with our practice, I wanna tell you kind of our central foundation. The reason that we do what we do in our practice on a daily basis, working with kids with neurodevelopmental disorders is because <clears throat> we know that the greater the amount of interventions that are required during labor and delivery and the greater the amount of stress that mom is under, research is clear. It dramatically increases the likelihood of there being a neurodevelopmental disorder in the child down the road. So if we can look backwards and say, if we can minimize the stress in mom, get mom's body as healthy as possible, reduce risk factors, reduce the likelihood for interventions, then we should then as a byproduct of that be able to reduce the child's lifetime likelihood of neurodevelopmental challenges across the board. So when we do this today, it's to help you as moms and dads, but it's also to help the baby. It's also helped that developing child. So we lower the likelihood of a future neurodevelopmental disorder. So when we look at this, you know, let's, let's say, let's say it like this, right? IVF can be an amazing tool. And for many couples, it's, it's what they've used to conceive and it's been the thing and God bless them. Fantastic. When that has worked, it may be used too early. You know, oftentimes with, with parents, they've not thought to go and look down the road of our whole other holistic ways that can help to heal their nervous system, heal their physiology that are far safer, far less invasive, um, and oftentimes have very high success rates. So, so let's look at this. Let's look at healing the body from the inside out and allowing it to naturally correct whatever is causing the problem, whether it's rebalancing the hormones, physiology. Let's create a better environment for conception because if you can create a better environment for conception, then you can change this entire algorithm. So we're gonna talk about three main things you need to be aware of. And if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to do this. Um, if you are, if you're watching the re-recording of this and you are, have questions, drop this in, drop comments in here. If you have questions about these things as we go through number one, three elements. Okay. We need to address chemical, physical, and emotional stressors. Okay. And I'm going to expand that and also put in one additional, let's put in nutritional chemical, physical, emotional, nutritional. So those stressors are the common stressors that we see in people all the time, every day. We live with them. They're everywhere. They are oftentimes pretty darn hard to turn off. As you go through the healing process, you may need to address one, two, three, even all four. And if, you know, as you're going through this, start going through an audit and think, where can I improve these factors now? Because much of what we're going to be talking about are things that are very actionable. The things that you can do today that you can implement right away because now it'll give you awareness points of things that you should be looking into, things that you should be starting to consider that can be in your environment that you can change literally the second that we get off of this video. So tools that we're gonna address are number one, chiropractic. <clears throat> I'm a chiropractor. I work in pediatric and family chiropractic. And I've had the privilege of seeing many, many, many women who came in that were struggling with infertility conceived while under care and as a result of care. <clears throat> I apologize. So, so I know how effective this is firsthand from seeing it. If you are a patient of ours that's watching this and you benefited um, by getting adjusted and were able to conceive, do me a favor, put this up here for, for the people that are watching this so they can hear it for themselves firsthand. If you're not one of our patients and this helped you, do me a favor, also put it in there because people need to hear these things that work. So secondly, traditional Chinese medicine. I'm going to lump traditional Chinese medicine in with acupuncture because oftentimes practitioners of TCM also practice acupuncture because they're so intimately intertwined with one another. So TCM acupuncture, um, two incredibly powerful tools that have been around for thousands of years that have helped hundreds of millions of people with fertility issues, um, childbirth, labor, delivery, really potent, but incredibly well-developed, well-studied techniques um, that, you know, not super common here in the States, but if you were to go to China, um, go to places where this is their normal, this is what they do. Western interventions that we use here in the States, not nearly as common there. A lot of these, these interventions have been proven incredibly effective and are the staples. For many of you who aren't aware, you know, the United States has, has amongst the highest infant mortality and maternal mortality rates, along with the lowest infant health rates of all the developed nations. So what we're doing isn't working. We need to be looking at these, these, these external ways Things like TCM, things like chiropractic, things like acupuncture, things like Ayurveda, um, things like homeopathy and naturopathy, because what they, what you look at, what you find commonalities is that they're looking holistically at the body. 
And that's something that's oftentimes missed. You know, Western medicine can be absolutely awesome in certain ways. But one of the things that they have lost over the course of the last 50 or so years is holism. You know, you see many, many specialties. Everyone's a specialist. Very few people are GPs. Um, and the loss of, of, of the general practitioner has also diluted the education about holism. Looking at the person as a whole, putting all the systems together, understanding how the brain works with the endocrine system, all the systems connect into one another. That's a piece that you really need to consider because when you lose the connection of how does one system affect the other, then what you do is you get localized, locked into one thing, and you think that your thing is the only thing, and then you miss the bigger picture. So what I'm asking you today is not to say one thing is good or bad. What I'm saying is expand your horizons and realize that these changes in perspectives can benefit you because the other practitioners are going to look at your body more as a whole. So the benefits of starting here are, are pretty big ones. Number one, find the root cause. You know, oftentimes the root causes are things where when you are given things by whoever is doing your testing, whether it's your OB or whoever the specialist is that you're working with, fertility specialist, they're looking at a symptom, motility issues, hormonal imbalances. What's not oftentimes asked is why. Let's step back and find out why these things occurred, what is driving this, and how do we actually heal the physiology and the neurology so they function like they should. Number two, by coming to the root cause that allows the body to heal naturally, correcting imbalances in physiology and neurology, there's a safety factor. Um, you know, all of the things that we just talked about, incredibly safe, incredibly safe. Side effects with all of these things are incredibly rare. So when you look from a safety factor, that's obviously something knowing that there's very low risk, very low complications, should definitely be at the forefront because why not try them? If these inter interventions can help you like they've helped so many thousands and millions of people worldwide to conceive, why not? And of course, there's a cost effectiveness. You know, any of these things, chiropractic, TCM, acupuncture, Ayurveda, homeopathy, naturopathy, cost effectiveness wise, they are far less expensive than IVF is by a lot. No matter how far down the road you go with any of these, whether, you know, you're you're looking at one or multiple of them together, the cost combined will probably be less than what you spend on IVF. So I'm going to start digging into to different things that we can use in terms of um, awareness points. So let's talk about nerve dysfunction as a cause of infertility. And so I'm a chiropractor, and so this is my specialty in particular. I want to talk to you about the nervous system because, you know, if you, if you understand the nervous system, then it gives you a better awareness of how your body works. So let's talk top down. Brain is like a CPU. It is the master controller for everything in the body. It talks to the body via the spinal cord to coordinate both organ, cell, endocrine function, everything. Brain regulates every bit of it. It's not independent though. The way that this works is <clears throat> all of these messages have to reach, <clears throat> reach the spinal cord by sensory nerves sending input to the brain through the spinal cord, exiting up there, through little holes in the spinal column, okay? Those messages, when they come in correctly, they reach the brain. The brain has a program that says, okay, there's something dysfunctional in this organ. Let's correct it. Body is, is self-regulating and self-healing. So that process should work flawlessly as long as the information coming in from the nerves comes in correctly, okay? When we look at the way that the spine integrates into this, the spine is built to protect the spinal cord. It does more than that though. And this is something that if you've never heard this before, hopefully this will give you some new awareness points as to why people that, that come to chiropractors for things like infertility issues, why it helps them. So, so one, the spine is loaded with little centers called proprioceptors. Little, these little proprioceptors are, are constantly measuring where we are in space. It's the reason why I can touch my fingers to my nose without looking at my fingers and know that they're wiggling even though I can't see them. It, it's, it's intimately involved in all controls of motion and posture. That sense, that, that particular sense of proprioception never shuts off. It's on 24 seven, even here at rest right now doing this presentation, 90% of my brain's work in the background is devoted to that single sense. Incredibly important. It has a secondary role. That secondary role is that it organizes sensory input to the brain. Each one of the vertebra, every joint in the body is built to move. When they work normally, signals come up through the cord, no interference, no background noise. The signals come up the way they're supposed to. Brain gets the messages, brain sends down correct signal. Hormones, tissues, organs, glands are regulated the way they're supposed to in what they call homeostasis, balance. Here's the kicker. A number of different things can affect the way that the spine works, okay? 
if the spine is not working the way that it should, there is this term we call disaffrontation, D-Y-S-A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-A-T-I-O-N, okay? That term is incredibly important. What it literally, what it literally means is static in the line, interference, incorrect input. Disaffrontation means incorrect input. So if the input coming in from whatever the end organ gland or tissue is, is not getting to the brain correctly, then in turn, when the brain gets the signals, it doesn't know accurately how to heal the, 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 the organ or tissue or gland or cell because the message is wrong, okay? So, so when you think about that, it's almost akin to like static in the line. And what you want to understand is that the spine, if there is an injury to the spine, these things in our, in our practice in chiropractic, we use this word called subluxation. It is, it's a catch-all term. As a term, what it literally means is that the spine is built to move in certain ranges of motion, okay? If something happens where the spine misaligns and it gets stuck, can't move the way that it's supposed to, what ends up happening is we lose the input from that area because of what's called the fixation, the loss of normal motion. The vertebra is supposed to do this, but it gets stuck and it can only do this and it's losing that. But what ends up happening is, is disapprecation is triggered. Loss of normal input, both from that area but any associated organs, glands, and cells at that level are going to have an, imp uh, have an input change. The messages are gonna come in, they're not gonna be as clear, they're gonna be distorted. So when you think about that, if you've ever had any kind of an injury to your spine, falls, sleeping, sports injuries, any of those things, they can all directly affect the ability of the messages coming in from your organs to get to your brain effectively. One of the big things you wanna keep in mind is that if the spine is subluxated, right? These are electrical signals and they're supposed to be transmitting up to the brain. If those message, messages are not coming in and they're coming in, in or, or they're not coming in, they're coming in a way that's distorted. And over time, what ends up happening, the distortions become bigger. The brain is having more and more difficulty with seeing what's going on inside the organ because the brain is running off an old program, kind of like a computer that hasn't updated. And over time, what ends up happening, the brain has a harder and harder time regulating the organs. So say, for example, it's like your, say it's your, your ovaries, and you've had a long history of issues with menstrual cycles and cramping and hormonal dysregulation. Well, one of the main reasons can be is if the brain's not getting the information correctly about what's going on with the ovaries and the brain can't properly regulate hormonal balance, can't properly regulate the cycle, can't properly re um, regulate the release of the eggs. And so these dysfunctions then can escalate and build over time because the disconnection between the brain and the ovaries becomes larger. So, so when these things happen and the brain's not getting this information, then kind of akin to it, like a cell phone conversation. So there's going to be periods of time where the information is distorted. Sometimes it's going to be dropped. But over time, what ends up happening is, is that the disconnection becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you think about the spine, <clears throat> what I want you to understand is that the severity and length of time that they are there determines the effect on body function. The longer they're there, the worse the, the, the effect is going to be. So when chiropractors adjust these subluxations, what it does is it allows the body to begin to heal without any, any interference between the organs, glands, cells, and the brain. So the brain has all of this coding, right, for how to heal the organs. So, so when we do the adjustments, the very simple intent of the adjustment is to clear the pathways make sure there's no interference so the brain can start to do the healing work it's supposed to of getting the signals back and forth and try and get the tissues to begin to heal, right? So once that occurs and enough time has gone by, then what we typically tend to see happen is that not only do people feel better, right? But even women who come in with long histories of issues with menstrual cycle problems and cramping and pain, and we tend to see symptoms like that lessen. But when women are coming in with infertility issues, if we can get the body to heal long enough, well enough, and control enough of the variables, then it's not uncommon that women are able to conceive. Hopefully this is making sense. If you're, if you're keeping up with me, do me a favor and let me know. Um, if you have questions about anything that I've said so far, um, go ahead and drop those in the comments as well, and I'll be more than happy to come back and maybe have it in a separate video and dig into to pieces of the questions that you leave behind. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Sorry about that. There are many factors that can cause spinal subluxations. It can be from tr like straight trauma. It can be accidents, falls. <clears throat> it can be vehicle accidents, falling off your bike, sports, roller skating, wrestling with your friends. It can be from you know kids, kids, you know kids, siblings fighting. It can be from falling off the monkey bars at school and so on. Even if you're unaware, 
that there is an injury to your spine. The spine still absorbs the impact of any fall that you ever take and may be injured. Even things like birth process. Birth process, believe it or not, can be a big impact on the function of the spinal cord uh, and the brain and the way that they work together. I mean, obviously that's the base of our practice. And one of the things that we see incredibly commonly, well over 95% of the times, is that children who had, who had a birth injury, um, because of a lot of interventions, force, things like that, C-sections, vacuums, whatever, when there are injuries to, to the cervical spine, um, even if they're undetected in terms of pain, they can have effects that can now be documented and researched and, set and shown to connect from those points in time of initial injury to the spinal column and spinal cord at birthplace that are showing up later on down the road as neurodevelopmental challenges. If you have questions about that, let me know. If you want to see some of the information, I'm more than happy to provide those things. So, so but oftentimes when, you know, when we have these initial injuries, there are other areas that may be more problematic, right? So if you broke an arm, obviously you're going to pay more attention to that. These things may heal. And we stop noticing the pain, the soreness, or whatever the injury was. And maybe the spine is, is feeling better by that point in time. But just because we don't feel pain, I'm going to disconnect this. Sorry about that, guys. Um, just because we don't feel pain doesn't mean that things are working the way that they're supposed to. Because one of the things the brain is built to do is hide this stuff. <clears throat> it's built to keep you functioning as high of a level as possible. So it'll compensate hide it from you. Um, but the problem is, is that if the injury isn't corrected in some way, shape or form by getting the spine adjusted, then they'll still be there in the background and they can start to manifest later on down the road as other symptoms. We see that all the time. And so over time, you may start to notice symptoms like um, issues with your spine starting to become sore, um, headaches, neck pain, low back pain, things like that. And these things may pre present months to years later after the initial trauma. So it doesn't correlate to, I have an injury to my spine and all of a sudden feel things. That's why people who have issues like um, concussions, they can have symptoms that, that, that develop from the concussions years down the road. People who have motor vehicle accidents have whiplash, they can start developing headaches months to years later. Um, there can be so many things that, that happen from the spine that can present many, many years after the initial injury because the brain gets to a point where it can't deal with that anymore, then all of a sudden, boom, symptoms begin to come out. So, so here's some signs that your spine may be telling you that something isn't right. Number one, soreness in the neck or back, real obvious. Two, headaches. Um, you know, the vast majority of all headaches happen from injuries to the upper part of the neck between the base of the skull and the first three vertebrae. Most common areas by a lot. Been doing this for a long time. It is, is consistent across the board. 90 plus percent of the time, that is the area of problem. Low back pain, whether it's chronic or intermittent, is a real common sign. Chronic aches and pains in the spine that seem to be coming back more and more often are a real common sign. Tightness and loss of range of motion. If you notice that you're having a hard time doing things like touching your shoes or turning your head, you feel like you're just not moving the same way, those are signs that the spine is compensating and probably had some injuries that it's been trying to hide from you. They can be warning signs. Now, where do a lot of these things come from other than that? Well, you know, if you have, listen, all of us, have had traumas to the spine, right? Things that can things that can be common factors in addition to those that we are dealing with that make things more evident or make things worse. Posture is a big one, guys. Um, you know, with with the advent of us having a population where we spend so much time at desks and at computers, posture is a huge issue. You know, weak core, um, too much or too little curve in the spine. These can all be issues that are created from poor posture. You know, student posture is a big one. I mean, think about it. This is what our kids are doing all day long, right? They're on tablets. They're on cell phones, especially right now at the time of this recording. You know, we're in COVID land and kids are in virtual schooling. Half of them are on Chromebooks and they're spending their entire day looking down on their Chromebooks and, and the neck is always, always flexed forward and it stretches the spinal cord. It causes injury and damage to the spine. And if your kids are, you know, if you have kids already and they're saying, you know, mom, dad, I'm getting headaches, my upper back, my neck hurts, all this stuff, or even their lower back. These are all postural related injuries. If you have a, a job where you have to be at a desk all day long or a lot of your day, um, you probably notice it too. You know, you're probably sitting with your posture getting more and more like this as the day goes on. Those kind of things create tremendous amount of strain on the spine and spinal cord, and they can dramatically increase their impact on the spine over time. Um, you know, sleeping in odd positions can be a, a big problem. You can, you know, sleep, curl up in a ball. You could sleep on your belly, which causes tremendous torque in the neck. And, you know, keep in mind, the, one of the reasons I highlight this is because this area of the spine is the most important area of the spinal column and spinal cord. The brainstem lives there. All the information that's coming in from the spinal column comes up to this one area to be filtered and sorted and sent to the brain. 
So that area from an important standpoint is absolutely the very top of the line, only second to the central nervous system, the brain itself. Um, you know, a lot of people even sleep twisted like a pretzel. Um, and that's something to keep up, keep in mind. You know, if you're sleeping in a, in a like a pretzel and you're twisted all over the place and arms, legs, and spine going in, di in different directions, that causes torque on the spinal cord. And those things can have issues that can present, you know, days, weeks, and months later. Um, and many times when they, when they start to really present themselves, they can present with a lot of dysfunction. They can present with a lot of pain. So I want to talk about a couple of other areas here that we need to talk about. So when we start talking about things like, like chemical stress, chemical stress is a big one. And it's one that some people have an awareness of, but a lot of times people don't understand chemical stress and what it really means. So let's talk about this, right? To our body, to our brain, stress is stress. Doesn't matter where it comes from. So too much stress in any system will cause the spine and the nervous system to subluxate. You know, we see it all the time, especially since we're just passing the holidays at the time of this recording, where the kids and the adults that we take care of eating a lot more junk food, a lot more sweets. And when we go through and we adjust the spine, we tend to see a lot of areas of the spine being affected that relate to digestion, right? So, so when we see that where there's a lot of these foods getting in and we see these same areas over and over and over again, we know food related, right? Food can be toxic to us. And so, you know, when they get past the holidays, they start cleaning up their diet. All of a sudden, those areas that were, were symptomatic and subluxated all the time during the holidays, once the diet's back to normal, they resolve because it's no longer creating stress inside of their body that's presenting at the level of the spinal column. And if you've never seen this before in yourself, I, I'm, I bet most of us have, right? Where when we're not eating well, we start noticing that my body doesn't feel right. Maybe I'm not digesting as well. Um, maybe I'm seeing effects where, you know, I'm having some issues with digestion or having issues with motility, having a hard time going to the bathroom, or maybe you just feel kind of blah. When food is causing a stress response in your body, you will not feel well. It's just the nature of how this works. So, so that's one part, you know, chemical exposure is a big issue too, right? Because chemical ex chemicals are all around us. They're in the air, on our skin, in our foods, um, they're in our clothes, detergents, candles, you name it. Chemical exposure can overwhelm our body's ability to heal, um, to heal correctly, causing massive stress in the nervous system and especially subluxation in the spine. And this is a big deal because, you know, chemical stress is something that once you understand how much chemical exposure you are having on a daily basis, one of the first things that you can do and, and action steps right here, big one, look at the, the chemicals in your environment, especially right now, right? We see it everywhere, right? There's hand sanitizer everywhere. There's a compound called triclosan in hand sanitizers, known neuroendocrine disruptor, messes with your endocrine system in a big way, messes with your nervous system in a big way. Yet it's a standard component in every hand sanitizer. If you're slather on a hand sanitizer 10 times a day, you're getting doses of an endocrine disruptor every time a day, 10 times per day. The soaps, the moisturizers, the lotions, the hair gels, the deodorants, all of those things, they can be significant contributors to chemical stress in your body. Let's talk about emotional stress. Emotional stress, such as work, relationships, past trauma, pace of life, all of those things can be huge. And the reason why I want to spend a second on this is because when you talk about things like emotional stress, emotional stress is one where if you, if you are dealing with past emotional trauma, past physical trauma, you internalize these things emotionally and, and mentally, and you're dealing with some kind of PTSD issues, they can literally keep your nervous system in constant stress mode. Emotional stress can have a massive, massive impact on your overall health. And if it's not changed, turned off, it can literally just tear you down. And we see that, you know, obviously your emotional state, but physiologically, it's really common that people deal with long-term emotional stress almost always will then deal with physical consequences of it because they're constantly secreting stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline, and their immune system gets weaker over time, their hormonal systems get weaker over time, and we start to see systems in the body begin to have a lot of issues, whether it's IBS, whether it's weakened immune system issues, whether it's arthritic conditions, all these things, they're given the opportunity to present because the body is now in such a state of stress that it's pushing the body's ability to heal further and further down just because of the emotional stressors. I hope this is making sense. Um, if this is something that it, you need some clarity on, drop it in the comments. I'll be more than happy to come back and talk about this. The results of all of these stressors, the chemical, the physical, the emotional, the nutritional stressors, they can all lead to infertility in you and your spouse. 
The inability of the body to self-regulate and self-heal because of any or all of these stressors will affect how the nervous system regulates hormone production, such as estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, as well as the ability of the, the reproductive, reproductive organs to function and reproduce properly. I want to give you an example, okay? I want to show you something that when I became a chiropractic patient, it was the biggest eye-opener. I remember looking at this thinking, huh, it started to put two and two together for me. So in this graph, what this is, is this is a, an anatomical example of, of the layout of the spinal column. If anybody wants this, drop a comment in here. I'm more than happy to send this to you so you can get a copy that you can have for yourself. So when you look at this, I want you to think breaker box. The, the spinal column organizes very similarly to the breaker box in your house. If you look at how it's color coded, C1 to 3, C4 to 7, T1 to 3, T4 to 7, T8 to 12, L1 to sacrum, okay? The reason they're broken down like that is because anatomically, every area has specific nerves that go in and out of those areas and regulate different specific systems. For example, C1 to 3, there's a really important nerve up there. And I say this because if you are dealing with infertility, this is this nerve, most important thing in the world to get working well. It's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the parasympathetic rest, digest, growth, development, healing side of the nervous system. If there is a subluxation on the spine in the region of the vagus nerve, the brainstem areas, it will affect the function of the vagus nerve negatively. So one thing that has to be done is we have to look at how do we activate the vagus nerve? Well, guess what does that? An adjustment. When a chiropractor adjusts you, it stimulates the vagus nerve to turn back on. Every time that we clear out subluxations on the spine, anytime that we find them and we remove interference, the vagus nerve works better. Anytime the spine stops moving, it turns on the function of the vagus because the nervous system has one really important role. It cannot be in growth and protection at the same time. If something is creating a stress response at the level of the spinal column and spinal cord, then it will create a constant nonstop background noise that will affect the ability of the parasympathetic nervous system to be on, AKA the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve regulates just about every single function that we care about. It is a regulator of our hormones. It regulates the, a, a significant portion of the function of the reproductive organs. It regulates our endocrine system. It regulates our immune system. Conversely, if you go down to the next level to C4, C7, the nerves that activate a fight or flight response exit the spine there. And so if we see that you're subluxated in that area, the input from that area, in addition to subluxation, other places will have a powerful effect in turning on the fight or flight response. When you look on the right side, you see all these, all these different effects. And the reason that is there is because anytime those systems are not working the way that they're supposed to, there's interference with their communication, any and all of the systems that are in those regions, their function can go downhill. So I hope this is hope this is helpful because I, I remember when I saw this for the first time and I started looking at these at my chiropractor's office and I started seeing the change that I was having in my own body. Oh my goodness, it was a complete game changer. So I want to take a moment and talk about the postural effect. So if you're wondering about about posture, you're wondering about your spine, you're wondering wondering about your alignment, I want to give you an example of what posture is supposed to look like, especially pregnancy posture. So in this example, you see the woman on the left. The woman on the left, she has, she has a posture that puts a tremendous amount of stress on her spinal column and spinal cord. You see that her head's pulled forward, shoulders are rounded, big curve in the back, way arched, knees locked, pelvis tilted way forward. And you see the difference in the position that the baby is in. So tilted further forward. And what that does is it makes it more difficult for passage down into the birth canal. A lot of the baby arrests in the pubic bone. That's why when a lot of women are dealing with, you know, a lot of these difficulties with labor, it's because the baby's in a position where it's difficult for them to transition. Conversely, if you look at the woman that's on the right-hand side, you see that she stands tall, heads pulled back up towards the ceiling, shoulders are down low. You're not seeing that she's got a lot of that rounding. You see that her shoulders are pulled back. You see her, her back curve is lessened. Pelvis is tilted back. Baby sits higher and a little more upright. Knees are soft. Okay, so she's not in a constant guard position, which is what you see on the woman on the left is her hamstrings are locking in, trying to guard, trying to pre prevent her from having any more tilt forward in the pelvis because the brain does have mechanisms to try and protect you. The problem is only work so well and they only work so long. And when you're pregnant, if you have a spine issue coming in, it's gonna get exacerbated, guaranteed. 
So if you're considering getting pregnant, you're not seeing a chiropractor, I absolutely tell you, you got to. We get women who come in who have had a long history of back issues and are miserable when they start and they feel better at the end of the pregnancy than they did at the beginning, which doesn't seem plausible, but we see it all the time. It's, it's one of the coolest things about doing what we do is that, you know, if a woman comes in and they have a history of back issues, they start getting adjusted, they've never been adjusted before, and they start getting it during, getting it during their pregnancy because someone referred them to, and they say, you know, it's funny, I feel better, I feel better now at the end of my pregnancy than I did coming in. It's a pretty darn cool thing when you can have a woman say something like that because, you know, pregnancy can be rough on people. Um, and if someone can come out of the pregnancy in better shape than what they started, we call it a major league win because it's good for mom's health, it's good for the baby's health. It means that we lowered her stress hormones, which in turn is going to, you know, calm down the baby's stress response, helping the baby's nervous system to develop more the way that it's supposed to, so on and so forth. So moving on for the sake of time, I want to talk about factors that influence infertility. This is a big one. So when we look at these, it can be affected by things like diet and food allergies. This is a big one because diet, if you've never heard about these anti-inflammatory diets, this is a huge one. Inflammatory diets they can create massive issues with the way that the body is able to work, heal, function. Um, it can predispose the body to a number of different things. Um, you know, if your diet leads you down the road of becoming obese, that's a whole different set of risk factors. You know, leading to things like um, you know PCOS and metabolic syndromes, um, all things that have been shown in so many different research studies to create things like you know PCOS, um, you know, significant issues with like endometriosis. Um, all of these things are directly, directly tied into to things what they call metabolic syndrome. Um, you know, you look at things like um, insulin resistance, right? That's one of the main side effects of, of being on a long-term high carbohydrate diet. That's you know stemming from metabolic syndrome, PCOS, obesity. You tend to see there's a lot of dysfunction in the thyroid. This is a really common factor. Um, long-term stress, whether chemical, physical, emotional, or otherwise, all can lead to adrenal exhaustion. Big time problem. Adrenal exhaustion means that you can't mount a proper stress response. The body's been on overdrive for so long that your body's ability to properly respond to stress is tapped out. That's one of the things that we focus heavily on here with our own practice is knowing where you are using some of the technology we have in our office in terms of your stress response and then working to build you back up because you have to have a stress response. It just has to be a balanced stress response where it's not on all the time by itself. It has to be balanced with breakpoints because the body, when you're pregnant or trying to become pregnant, should spend the majority of its time in rest, digest, growth, development, and healing mode, AKA parasympathetic. There can be uh, damage from improper exercise, especially excessive exercise. If you have anybody that you know, or maybe this is you where you exercise excessively and you're missing periods, um, you're having, you know, having a lot of issues with getting your period where you may be having months where you're going without it or it's really off cycle. That is a sign that your hormones are completely disrupted because of the amount of exercise. Um, and this is a really common thing when we see people get to a point where they're exercising way too much and the body's in a constant state of overtraining and it disrupts the endocrine system. And this is a big problem that really needs to be addressed. So if this is you, definitely time to start looking at things like getting heart rate variability done, start getting information about how much you're exercising, start talking with providers like myself and others about what you can do to calm your nervous system down, get your body to heal so we can get you back on track with your menstrual cycle. Um, Things like STD damage to reproductive organs can be a huge complicating factor. Um, environmental toxins um, and chemicals can definitely lower sperm count or alter a woman's menstrual cycle. Um, interesting fact, there are 15 known chemical compounds that are in the, in the home and work environment that are known endocrine disruptors. And this is one that really oftentimes will blow people's minds. Um, you know, these things, they can disrupt the chain of hormone release, which, which absolutely must happen for ovulation. Um, they're essential for fertilization, implantation of the embryo, and so on. Um, contraceptive pills. My goodness. I mean, if you've ever read one of the leaflets about contraceptive pills, um, it's hard to believe that you want to take them if you actually like looked at the side effects because there's so many and there's, they're so big and I get it, right? Many people do it because you want to regulate your period, obviously protecting pr against pregnancy if you're not trying to conceive, but the effects on these things can be pretty big, you know, increasing risk factors for estrogen dominance leading to breast cancer and so on, clotting risks, all that stuff. So, um, so these things are messing with hormones in very real ways. Um, hormone disruptors, endocrine disruptors, these are a big deal because they're, they're so common now in the environment. See, the endocrine system and the hormonal system, it releases, um, excuse me, the endocrine system releases hormones that influence every function of the body, um, 
And this is a big deal because they regulate things like your mood, growth and development, metabolism, sexual function, reproductive processes, things like that, like we just talked about before. These endocrine disruptors, they can mimic hormones that are in your body, such as estrogen and other compounds that regulate our body. And they're everywhere, right? Common sources of it, you probably don't even realize it, but they're coming from things like household cleaning products, body care products, furniture and building products, foods that we eat. I mean, think about it. Foods are commonly treated with this stuff called endosulfan. It's a common pesticide. Um, and this endosulfan is, a, is, a, is used on food crops, such as grains, tea, fruits, vegetables, and non-food crops, such as tobacco and cotton. It, it's even oftentimes used as a wood preservative. So, so this is why, especially when you talk about nutrition, eating an organic diet is so incredibly important. So another action step is if you're not eating organic, start going organic today. The more you can get these toxins out of your body, the faster your body can get into a state of healing and taking away one major stressor, okay? Um, a lot of common hormone disruptors out there. There's things like phthalates. Soy products are known as a, um, an endocrine disruptor. Soy, interestingly enough, you know, there's, there's a lot of conflicting information about the health benefits of soy. But the thing of it is, is there's enough information out there which should make you skeptical because there's enough research that says that, that soy can potentially lead to endocrine, um, endocrine imbalances, especially estrogen dominances. Because it is a, when it breaks down, it is a, it is a pseudoestrogen. So it, it mimics estrogen. So if there are things in there that are acting like estrogen, it can cause your own hormonal system to overreact and need to produce less or too much estrogen. So things like bisphenol A, which is a huge issue, and unfortunately too commonly found. If you're not familiar with what bisphenol A is, let me know, I can go through and do a whole presentation on this stuff for you. Um, things like methoxychlor and vinclizin, um, perfluoroactinoic acid, PFOA, by a bovine growth hormone. Uh, if you're not familiar with what it is, that's, that's the stuff they give to, uh, to give to dairy cows so that they can either produce more milk or that so they can grow faster, to get bigger, to make more meat. Um, and that's why another reason why you should eat organic because the, the cows that are, that are organically raised, none of that stuff is in them. Um, fluoride that is, is commonly found in, um, in toothpaste. So that's obviously a huge issue and common even water supplies. Um, the contraceptive pills, let's talk about that for a sec. So I wanna dig into this for just a moment. So in addition to messing with hormonal levels, it also affects vitamins. So if you're taking multivitamins and eating well, you may not realize it, but the, the contraceptive pills, they alter your intake of vitamins A, B1, B2, B6, B12, C, E, K, folic acid, and biotin. All really important things. You know, I mean, you've heard about how many issues with folic acid causing neural tube defects. If you see anything in the news about, about deficiencies, right? They always tell you about taking folate um, and it's always because of neural tube defects. Well, if the, the fertility, the contraceptive pills are messing with your ability to go and absorb um, folic acid slash folate, um, then that by itself can be, be something that can be a contributing factor to neural tube defects. So it can also affect the absorption of minerals such as iron, calcium, magnesium, potassium, selenium, zinc, and copper. And this is a big issue because these minerals are really, really important in so many different ways. And we'll dig into these here in just a sec. But these minerals, if they're not being absorbed properly, the foods you're eating, the, the vitamins, mineral supplements you may be taking, completely worthless. But these, these minerals have so many important functions. I mean, iron simply just, if you just look at one major function, red blood cell production, right? So the ability of your red blood cells to carry oxygen, huge issue. So, so that is a huge problem in itself. Clotting factors, huge issue. Um, calcium and magnesium, um, potassium are all, all electrolytes. So electrolyte imbalances. Um, calcium and magnesium and, uh, are in, and uh, um, potassium are also really big in regulation of water balance. Um, they are, are intimately involved in contraction of muscle tissue. Magnesium has roles in, in doing things like protecting this, the, the nerve endings um, so that they're not getting too much stimulation that causes stress responses. Keeping pain lower, calming down the nervous system. Magnesium actually protects the ends of the nerves so that noxious or, or irritating stimulus can't get into the brain. They protect the nerve endings. So, so huge issues. And zinc is, is really important for pregnancy and, and conception. So, so contraceptive pills, they confuse the body's hormone levels. They cause excessive release of estrogen and progesterone. And over time, they can jeopardize a woman's uh, natural ability to regulate their hormones because these synthetic hormones, what they do is they tell your brain that they don't need to, that you don't need to produce as much. So your brain will do what's called down regulation. It'll turn down the amount that you naturally produce 
because it became dependent upon the hormone pill to, to produce it. So this becomes a huge issue because if you're not making your own natural levels at the levels you're supposed to, and then you come off of the pill, then all of a sudden your levels don't rebound, you're infertile. So, so let's talk a little bit more about ways that we can address this more effectively. So we need to talk about nutrition um, and we need to talk about the importance of some of these things. So iron, as we talked about already, this is a big one, but I want to talk to you about some stats. So there was a study done through a Harvard School of Public Health, um, excuse me, Harvard School of Public Health. It was a study of 18,555 premenopausal women um, who became or attempted to become pregnant over an eight-year period of time. Women who used iron supplements were 40% less likely to have ovulation-related infertility than non-users. Just iron. Vitamin E. Vitamin E has been shown in multiple research studies in animals in particular um, that it can lead to infertility. So if you're not taking at least 200 IUs per day of vitamin, uh, vitamin E, make sure you start taking that. Calcium and magnesium, as we talked about, these are super important for overall health for a million different reasons. I can do a whole presentation on these. One of the big things, especially as it relates to fertility, is they support the rhythmic contraction of the fallopian tubes that help with sperm motility. Green food supplements. So green food supplements have been shown to improve sexual activity and drive. Um, a combo of barley grass, brown rice, wheat grass, chlorella, and kelp was found in one study to dramatically improve sexual activity. They're rich in vitamin K, EB12, um, iron, and antioxidants. Um, spirulina also is, is another great source. So if you want to add that in, obviously that's all good. Uh, there, is, there was a study that was in, uh, in the journal Fertility and Sterility um, called Beet Propolis. This was an interesting one. It showed in a trial um, where 60% of women with endometriosis took 500 milligrams per day of beet propolis, excuse me, twice per day. 60% um, of women, I, I'm sorry, let me start over. One study in fertility and sterility discusses a trial where 60% of women with endometriosis took 500 milligrams of beet propolis two times daily became pregnant. Whereas in the placebo group, only 20% of the women with endometriosis became pregnant. That is a staggering number. If you're not taking B propolis and you're dealing with infertility, jump on it. Multivitamins, I mean, I can't say enough about having a good multivitamin. They are so essential for good health because they are the foundation, right? You, you need to make sure that your food and your, and your multivitamins, they form the basic levels of, of foundational nutrition to go and build a strong firm foundation for health in your body. If you are not eating a clean diet every day, and listen, Guilty is charged, none of us do. Multivitamins are there to go and fill in the cracks. All of the things that we do, right? We, we make recommendations every day for basic foundational pieces, multivitamins, magnesium, vitamin D3, omega-3 fatty acids, and probiotics. A good multivitamin carries in it a lot of the things that we were just talking about, right? So women, if you're, if you're taking a multi, it should always be one that has a, um, a, a, a food-based form of iron. If you get a lot of the mineral-based ones, they can be extremely difficult for your body to absorb. So if you're gonna take a, a multivitamin, really look for whole food um, with all of your vitamin supplements if possible, unless you have specific sensitivities and that's a whole different animal, okay? So, but really like understanding the importance of having a really good nutritional foundation cannot be understated because it's the environment created in your body. So I wanna talk a little bit about preconceptive health. So parental health prior to conception is a main factor influencing success through becoming and maintaining pregnancy. When you look at this, you wanna talk about several areas of focus. Number one, self-care. What do you do for you? What are you doing that helps you to take care of yourself? Um, are you getting adjusted on a regular basis? Are you seeing an acupuncturist? Are you getting massage? What are you doing to deal with your stress? You know, you look at things like healthy habits. Are you building healthy habits? Are you meditating? Are you um, you know, eating well? Are you exercising? What are you doing that helps you every day to go and take very small steps towards better health? Um, you know, looking for essential nutrition, right? There's certain things that you just have to really focus on when you are looking at trying to, um, to prep your body to, to carry a baby. And, you know, like we talked about before, right? Building that nutritional foundation. So when pregnancy time does come, you've got the absolute best environment for your baby. The better nutrition that you invest in now, the better health your baby will have later. And we're not just talking at the time of delivery, excuse me, we're talking lifelong because what you do foundationally when you're pregnant is gonna determine how well the baby's immune system, nervous system, physiological systems, all body systems develop. So this is critical. You wanna watch toxic load. And I know we've talked about this 
but I want to I want to do this here because you know we're not not too far from the end. When you look at toxins, they are so prevalent in in our our environment more so than we've ever seen before. You know, we've got GMOs, we've got compounds that are are being put on our skin, in our bodies, in the air, around us every day, and more than our bodies have ever ever, ever been stressed by these things before. If you have a lot of chemicals in your home, if you're using Clorox and Lysol and all these chemical cleaners, get them out. Go to the organic plant-based compounds that are not gonna create massive stress responses in your body. Get the Clorox and the Lysol out of the house. Those things are garbage. Toxic, toxic, toxic. Start going to things that are organic, plant-based that are not gonna cause your body harm, okay? And make sure that you know if you have to have contact with any kind of chemical, you've got a physical barrier, rubber gloves, things along that lines. Try and avoid breathing this stuff in, right? If you're, you know, if you're cleaning your toilets with Clorox and using bleach, get away from that stuff, especially if you're looking to conceive. Remove toxins as, as much and as fast as possible. If you have questions about how to go and remove those toxins, so let us know. We are more than happy to give you recommendations here, okay? There are some useful preconceptive tests that you can get done. Um, and these can be performed by a naturopath or a, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. So uh, things like a zinc, zinc taste test. So zinc is the most important trace mineral for pregnancy and it should be tested prior to conceiving for best overall outcomes. Um, so I would definitely look for someone that does practice TCM slash acupuncture so you can take care of two birds with one stone. Live blood cell analysis, hair trace mineral analysis and urine screen for heavy metals. These are really important tests. Um, they can tell you how, how, how healthy you are at a molecular and cellular level. They can identify factors. They can be creating adverse events. If you are carrying heavy metals in your body, you've got to take care of this first. Um, you know, one reason for decline in zinc levels is high presences of heavy metals. So this is a big deal. If you've been exposed to heavy metals, then uh, this is something that you really wanted to address early and often um, because it can affect not just, you know, your ability to conceive, but it can also affect brain development for the baby. Um, Many people have undetected food sensitivities such as dairy, soy, and wheat that can be detected in any one of those tests. Uh, you wanna get tested for iron stores. Uh, knowing your iron status prior to conception uh, can give you an opportunity to normalize your blood iron level. And this is a big deal um, because you know obviously blood is so crucial to overall health for you and the baby, but it also affects oxygenation levels um, and a number of different factors that are really critical to your overall health. Getting a dental checkup, I would encourage you this highly. Um, you know, because you really don't want to have to go through and put in anything into your body during pregnancy that's uh, that's unnecessary. So have any major dental work done prior to conceiving. Um, if you have any mercury-based based amalgams, go in and get those removed ASAP, okay? Because you do not want those in your body um, because they, they, you know, can and will cross the blood-brain barrier for you and your developing baby. Uh, look for dentists who utilize more holistic approaches or at least open to those methods of care um, and have open conversations with your dentist. You know, one thing I will encourage you is that, and this is something I want to say this very, very, very clearly. Healthcare is consumer healthcare. You choose your providers. They are not, they are not your boss. They work for you. And this is to my patients too. I work for you guys. If you're watching this, you have doctors that are not on board with your healthcare, the way that you want it to be, fire them. Have the providers on the bus for you that work for you the way you want them to work for you. People that align with your belief system and what you're trying to accomplish. And if they don't, fire them. Find someone else. You might love them as people. They might be the best people in the world. But if you're constantly in conflict of, over what you want for your health and your child's health, your preconceptive health, your pregnancy delivery strategies, get other people. Get the right people on the bus. It will make your life easier. Um, and obviously, of course, you know once you become pregnant and you deliver, um, you want to try to avoid any type of major medical procedures, dental procedures during lactation. So in conclusion here, guys, I hope that this training has opened your eyes to areas to focus on to improve the likelihood of successfully, successfully conceiving without the need for fertility treatments. There is a lot of things that we addressed here. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, I would love it if you could leave comments below to let me know what questions you had. Um, let me know where we can help because the whole point of doing these videos is very specifically to help you to overcome your fertility challenges um, so that you can have the blessing of being a parent because those little monkeys back there, those are my babies. So they're a few years older than that now, but I just love this picture. Um, but I want you to be part of that. I want to help you to do anything you can. Our, our practice here, myself, Dr. Brandon, Dr. Lena, we're all parents. We all want every person that comes through our door to be able to have the joy of becoming a parent. 
And if this is something that you're struggling with, we want to do everything we can to help you, whether it's you only watch our videos and we never meet you in person, or you come into our practice because something here said, I want these people to help me, whatever we can do to help, let us know. So if we can help you directly, call us, elitefamilychiros.com, 440-230-2300. Contact us through Facebook. If you're not in our area, let's, let us let us help you. We are part of a large group of doctors that, that are in this, this realm. Um, who have every bit of, of expertise like I do, who can help you with these challenges. So um, if you are looking to become pregnant um, and you're, you know, or you know someone who is looking to become pregnant or you are pregnant, there is an upcoming webinar, uh, excuse me, advanced training that will be happening in a webinar format on January the 14th. So Dr. Brandon will be going live doing a, uh, an advanced training specifically on pregnancy. He is going to dive deep into some really important information that you want to be in there for, for, for um, helping you to have the healthiest pregnancy possible. As we mentioned before, one of the biggest things that we want to do from this is we want to bring down the rates of birth interventions, increase the amount of healthy babies that are being delivered, decrease the amount of neurodevelopmental challenges. Because if we start here, moms and dads, we can make a real impact on this, but it starts by helping you to conceive in a healthy way that doesn't require lots of stress in your body allows your body and your nervous system to start to work the way that it's supposed to, starting from the ground up, building that solid foundation. So that when you do become pregnant, there's a lower need for birth interventions and God willing, not even needing any at all. So you can have a healthy vaginal delivery. And then helping to maximize your child's neurological development for those earliest phases. Hope this was helpful for you, moms and dads. Um, if you have any questions, again, drop those questions down in there. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great day and be elite.